So, I haven't really mentioned it much here before, but Infinity Train is one of my favorite cartoons out there right now, hitting all the right notes when it comes to storytelling, lore, character arcs, and intrigue. But what I find most fascinating about the show is its structure and presentation, and how it uses its format as an anthology series to stand out from any other cartoon out there. If you didn't know, each season of Infinity Train follows a different set of protagonists on their journey through the train cars, tackling different character arcs, different stories, and different aspects of the train itself. And despite all these differences between seasons, there's still a larger story being told throughout. So let's look at the show from above, and find out how this seemingly paradoxical, serialized anthology works. So, Infinity Train has three separate stories so far, with Book 4 on the way in 2021, according to the animation studio working on it, even if it hasn't been officially announced. Given how much the show has been trending on Twitter and HBO Max itself, though, it's very likely we'll get the full eight seasons creator Owen Dennis has laid out for the show, which has me hyped. But, you and I both know this isn't the Infinity Train news channel. So, let's talk about the supposed paradox, the serialized anthology, as I've dubbed it. The term serialization refers to when the storyline of a series continues from episode to episode, rather than having the series tell standalone stories. Oftentimes, modern cartoons will be semi-serialized, having specific episodes that focus on larger story or plot, and many individual episodes that simply tell their own stories which fit the average tone of the show. A good example of a fully serialized cartoon would be Green Eggs and Ham on Netflix. Semi-serialized would be Gravity Falls, and non-serialized would be Phineas and Ferb. And I know someone is going to say, but Phineas and Ferb referenced past episodes. Yeah, it did. And that's continuity, not serialization. So, now that we know what serialization is as it applies to TV series, what exactly is an anthology? An anthology series is a series which tends to explore multiple different concepts and ideas in which episodes share a similar structure or format, but where character progression and plot threads are usually nowhere to be seen. Perhaps the most famous anthology series is the classic Twilight Zone, which features numerous completely separate moral tales packaged with a unique thought about the nature of humans or the world in each episode. The primary connection between the episodes was the style, tone, and episode introductions. Now, when Infinity Train calls itself an anthology series, it means that more by season instead of by episode. Each season is tonally unique, explores different questions of morality and human nature, just like the Twilight Zone, and the leads of each season are given their own arcs and then seemingly forgotten about by the show. And that's about where its similarities to a normal anthology end. You see, a regular anthology series can be picked up at any point and any episode understood mostly in its entirety without context. But that's not Infinity Train. If you miss a season, or even an episode, you miss character introductions, lore about the train and the world, and the important story beats that have a lasting impact. So like any serialized series, the series is designed to be watched in order, with each and every detail paid attention to in order to complete your understanding of the world. In addition, there's a clear timeline, with each season taking place chronologically after the previous one. But more so than the recurring characters, plot lines, and even train cars, the biggest connection is that every aspect of the show is tied into the mystery surrounding the train's very existence. It appears to be man-made, running on robotics and science rather than magic of any sort. Everything in the train has been carefully calculated to help people adjust their moral compass and sort out any emotional issues. The train appears differently to each person who boards it, wait, no, boards it, and learns based off a person's memories what the train needs to teach them. This obviously poses a lot of moral questions that the show explores, particularly regarding those on the train who aren't passengers that can go home, but instead only exist to serve the train and its purposes. Excuse me, I have some abstract philosophical concepts I need explained. Oh, of course, sir. Give me one moment to answer this call. These train denizens, including Lake in season two, all have their own opinions about the train and their place in it. And if Tuba is to be believed, they can start families and live entire lives on the train. Kids, huh? So you're probably gonna need to head back to him at some point? No. I am on my own now. Nuh-uh, you're with us. Of course. If the cat is to be believed, they aren't necessarily required to follow through helping the passengers they're supposed to, and often deal with their own emotional baggage. 
You left me, so give me something for grace. I didn't leave you, Simon. I ran. There's a difference. No, there isn't! That gome almost got me! I didn't realize you weren't by my side until the next car. But you never came back. I... No. All these questions build on each other from season to season, and there doesn't appear to be one single correct answer or opinion that the show presents. But then there's the show's greatest mystery. Who made the train? And why? And let me tell you, there are many theories. The most prevalent theory is that the train is from the future, the track encircling Earth in a nearly endless loop. This could be supported by the idea that the Earth was destroyed in a nuclear conflict of sorts due to a degradation of mankind's nature. As a potential last resort, the remaining scientists of the future designed the train to be a gateway to the past, to teach former generations how to properly deal with their problems. While it's an interesting theory, I'm not sure quite how believable it is, as introducing time travel into the story would create far more questions than answers, but we've gotten way off topic here. The point I'm trying to make is, the burning moral questions and overarching mysteries at the show's core make it far more than just an anthology series. It's a series that uses the best aspects of both anthologies and serialized shows to create something utterly unique in the world of TV animation. A series that explores deep themes such as divorce, mental breakdowns, and the morality of the world without a narrative that remains focused on a consistent group of main characters. It takes the concept of serialization and applies it to the larger story of the train's conception and operations, as well as to many minor recurring characters throughout the series. It also allows for setups of new characters in seasons where they aren't the stars, weaving the narrative in a wonderfully complex way. And the overarching story has truly only begun as of the end of Book 3, with Hazel and Amelia looking to be the protagonists of Book 4 as they go to the engine and work out Hazel's issues with One One. <laughs> And that's what's so amazing about this show. It uses the nature of its structure to present compelling character stories about different people in both the real world and the train's world, while simultaneously telling a grander story about a train that imprisons people against their will for a seemingly good cause, but with no definitive source for its motivations or existence. So, as it turns out, the Infinity Train Paradox isn't really a paradox at all, because the show found a way to make everything work and flow on both a serialized and anthological level, building the viewer's engagement and investment all the more. I think this is best summarized in this recent quote from Alex Hirsch about why Gravity Falls was so successful. I try not to get too caught up in what the trends are or what the industry is doing, but I think Gravity Falls had a little bit of influence on the industry by having continuity that didn't just reset at the end of every episode. When we made the show, there were no half-hour animated comedies in the West that were aimed at kids that had continuity. There was sort of an iron wall between kids' comedies and anime and action shows when it came to format, and I've seen much more mixing and mingling of genres and much more continuity since the show ended. One of the exciting things about this moment with streaming and with the internet and so much content is that you're seeing all these old walls between different types of storytelling start to evaporate. And that has been proven true. Infinity Train was greenlit and written as an HBO Max original, and it only got moved to Cartoon Network because the show was ready before the streaming service. But the advent of streaming services has led to so many unique stories, and this one is no different. It breaks ground in animation and serialized anthology storytelling. And I, for one, am incredibly excited to see more. Hashtag Renew Infinity Train. Oh, please, please, please don't let this cancellation be permanent. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching, and be sure to go support Infinity Train on HBO Max, as I can't wait to see the grander plan in store for the series as a whole. Who knows how far we'll be by book 8. And that's on Studio Leadership. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you back in Dimension 1. Alright, so as of the posting of this video, Infinity Train Book 4 should be on HBO Max. I am extremely excited, I'm probably watching it as you're listening to this outro and working on a video for it. I'm gonna have a video about Book 4 on the channel within the next week or so. I'm not sure if it's gonna be a review or a video essay, but I'm just gonna see how I feel after I watch the season and what I want to talk about. Like I said in the video, if you haven't seen any of Infinity Train, go catch up on HBO Max, grab that free trial, and just binge the whole thing. It's like an eight hour binge. You should be able to get through it really fast. 
The other big thing this week is Amphibia, with and Sasha and Marcy finally meeting in the third temple, so I want to try and find time to squeeze in a video about that, but I'm not sure when I'll be able to get around to it. I also have a special React video coming pretty soon that's something new and I've never really done before, so you should get excited for that. And I hope you all have a great rest of your afternoon, day, evening, night, or whatever time it is you're watching this. Thank you.